We've got this system of single use plastics that are not meant to be reused or long lasting, which end up in landfill, which end up seeping into the water, which end up making undrinkable water. If we look at the map of these toxic waste dumps that come from, yeah, single use products, um, waste management facilities, um, pulp and paper mills, all of these sort of toxic um, systems, they overwhelmingly are placed in community of communities of color. So, and that's not by mistake, that's on purpose. Um, can you think of one wealthy white neighborhood that has a toxic dump next to it? No. Uh, so if yeah. you look at the map of Canada and you look at the place that all these toxic places are being placed, they're almost always next to communities of color that have little to no agency to advocate against these systems. When I first started my wedding photography business back in 2011, I made just $5,000 in my business. Now I bring in multiple six figures per year while working only 30 hour weeks serving my dream couples. I'm here to help you discover that it's so possible to have what you want when you want in your business so that you can create the life you've always dreamed of and deserve. Welcome. Welcome back to another episode of the Shine and Thrive podcast. If you're someone who cares deeply about the environment and social justice and wants to learn how you can make a greater impact through your photography business, then my friend, you are in for a treat. This episode was literally made for you. In this powerful episode, I chatted with Julia McClellan on how we as photographers, and more importantly, the way I see it, as fellow humans, can become more socially conscious and eco-friendly in a way that creates true lasting change. We dove into how to house clean our digital footprint, what actions to focus on to make the most sustainable impact on the planet, and what you can include in your wedding packages to support causes such as climate change, and what you can include in your wedding packages to support causes such as climate justice. And now a little bit more about Julia before we dive into the episode. Julia is a Canadian music theater performer and a passionate environmental advocate. She has performed on stages across North America, including three companies of the Tony Award-winning Kinky Boots, and including on Broadway. She has also had the immense fortune of being on some of Canada's biggest stages, starring as Val Clark in Stratford's A Chorus Line, and alternating the role of Dorothy Gale in the North American premiere of Andrew Lloyd Webber's The Wizard of Oz. Her stage career intertwines with climate activism as she is the co-founder of the Canadian Green Alliance, and she's also the creator of the Zero Waste Warbler, the low waste and low impact resource designed to help people reduce their footprint on our world. Julia freaking blew me away with her perspective on this topic, and I can't wait for her to blow your mind too. So stay tuned and enjoy. All right. Oh my gosh. Welcome, Julia, so much. I'm so excited to chat with you. And thank I you so much for having me. Yeah, of course. I'm so excited. And like, it's so fun how we're like meeting for the first time now. But of course, we're both passionate about a topic. It'll be so easy for the conversation to flow. Um, and as you know, we're going to start with a game. <laughs> Two, th- yes. Truth and a lie. And I cannot wait to play this. I've never played this before. And I've always wanted to. So you are popping my cherry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm honored. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. So maybe, okay. So maybe I'll go first. So guess my, guess my lie. Okay. Okay. I'm ready. All right. Number one, I can play a song on the piano backwards. Number two, (laughs) this is going to make me laugh. I had (laughs) diarrhea in my pants at the library one time and I had to walk home that way. (laughs) Okay. Okay. Number three, I won a singing competition in high school. Okay, I think you're what was the first one? I can play a song on the piano backwards. That's too specific. That has to be true. Um what was your third one? I won a singing competition in high school. 
Okay, I think that one's the lie. You got it. Yes. <laughs> That's impressive. You know, your intuition is on fleek. <laughs> no, I'm like, and I'm not kidding. I'm a professional actor. This is like the stuff we do all the oh time. Oh my God. That's amazing. Okay. I'm excited for yours now. <laughs> okay. Okay. Mine are less interesting, but maybe harder to guess. Okay. Okay. My first one is I have three dogs, dog obsessed. My second one is that I routinely live in two different countries and I switch back and forth quite often. And my third is that I own five businesses. Oh, shit. I was trying to pay attention to your, uh, <laughs> your facial expressions. <laughs> I'm like, I want to. Okay. Second one is a lie. No. Damn I it. do routinely live in two countries all you the time. Do? Okay. Yes, before I, you tell me the lie, which countries? Um, the, the states in here. Like okay. I'm, I've pretty much spent the majority of my professional career back and forth between the states and here. So yeah, yeah kind of both go. home. Okay. Oh my gosh. So I guess I have to just guess. Okay. Okay. Three business or sorry, five businesses. Mm-hmm. That's a lie. That's true. What? <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Christ. But I don't have any dogs, which is the oh, greatest really? sadness of my life. <laughs> oh, so it was like half, obs- uh, half a lie. Cause you are obsessed. True, but I don't actually own them. Just, oh, yeah. I just uh, stalk them all on Instagram. <laughs> oh my gosh. Damn. Okay. Well, you won. Ding, ding, ding. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay. That was fun. Definitely not. Definitely doing that again. Yeah. Okay. That's a good one. So I'm so excited to chat with you about sustainability. Like I heard you chatting with Lindsay on her podcast and I was mm-hmm. just so captivated by your guys' conversation. And I I was like, oh my gosh, I'm also like really passionate about this. I think, again, I think it's kind of like in my mind right now, as I say, I'm really passionate about this. The thing that comes up is like, um, what's it called? Imposter syndrome. Like, yeah, but Sarah, you're not doing enough. Right. So, but I am someone that like grew up passionate about it. I, I try my best to be conscious, but I know I could be better and all that stuff. But I'm like, you know what? Why didn't I think of this as a topic for the podcast for business owners to become more sustainable? So Mm -hmm. I'm so excited to dive in. And to start off, I feel like I want to start at like when a small business owner and specifically in this case, it's going to be photographers. If they decide that they want to become more sustainable, like where do they even start? Yeah, I think for small business owners, the idea should be that you should start your business off or at least like start to try and work through your business model and see if you can set up like sustainable systems for yourself. I think one of the trickiest um, sort of things for individuals when they're trying to be sustainable is that the businesses that they interact with and the companies that they buy from, all of these sort of services that we're going out and using aren't set up with sustainable systems. So then the onus kind of falls onto the individual to try and make choices that are sustainable in a not sustainable system. So for business owners, if you can set up sustainable systems within your practices, it's such a huge relief on individuals and such it can be a huge relief on your business as well. Um, so I would say instead of really nitpicking on like these small, um, sort of like minuscule things like, oh God, I have one bit of plastic here or, or whatever, focus more on the larger picture upon when you think of a product that you need for your business, can you think through the whole life cycle of that product? So an example of that might be, let's say, um, you work in a field where you need a ton of masks or rubber gloves that's probably not going to be able to be reduced if you work in a in an industry that needs sanitation but how can we think through the end life of that product and try to get it to a place where it can be reused or you know remade into something else so a solution might be to work with a company like TerraCycle who offers like recycling boxes for hard to recycle products so just setting up systems within your business that can help and just making like small adjustments to already existing systems can help too. Like, can you just choose a better paper for your business? Can you choose one that's forest stewardship certified? Can we choose things that are post-consumer recycled? So it doesn't have to be this massive adjustment to your business, but how can we make systems that work better for the environment inside our business? Okay, cool. And something that I'm, I, I mean, for photographers, the way that we kind of work is we have our camera which is now digital then Mm -hmm. we work on our computers to edit 
like work on our business digitally, then we deliver the photos digitally. And the only way we kind of would use, uh, would create an end product would be like a family, like a, or not a family, but like a heirloom album or prints and stuff like that. But that is something mm-hmm. that doesn't get thrown out. It's actually something that preserve, stays preserved for gener- generations, right? So I'm trying to think of like, along the line of like, we don't really have physical products that we offer. And I'm trying to think of how can we be more sustainable in other ways? So like you just mentioned, it's not always about going with with the vendor that's most sustainable because right now not too many exist. So is there any other ideas that you could think of for like maybe an entrepreneur or business owner that is more like digitally, like yeah. you just think digitally more? Yeah, it's a really interesting topic because I think a lot of people assume that as the majority of our operations as a society moves online, that that inanely makes us less wasteful or inanely makes us more sustainable. And it's actually not incredibly true because our sort of digital consumption, digital saving, all this stuff that we're doing online has to exist somewhere. For us as individuals, we don't see it, right? But if we think about every single thing we save, every single thing we search, every single thing we open our laptop to do, that requires power and it requires bandwidth and it requires storage. So if you just give a quick Google search to what a server actually looks like out there in the world that actually stores all of this digital contribution, it's a massive and they are huge greenhouse gas emitters. So our digital footprint is actually a huge thing that we need to start to think about when we're talking about conservation and and sustainability. And so one of the ways that digital contributors can really um, enhance their their footprint reduction is to think about carbon offsetting your practices, which if you don't know what carbon offsetting it is, is it's basically um, donating money to organizations that have carbon sinking or carbon sequestering practices. So let's say uh, you want to offset your digital contribution. You could carbon offset it and pay money to a company that's planting X amount of trees, the same amount of trees that it would take to sequester the amount of carbon that you're off putting for that project. So there's tons of ways that we can also work to reduce our digital consumption as well. Right. That's such a great point. And right off the bat, what comes to mind is um, you probably won't know this since you're not a photographer, but like for photographers listening, uh, there are tools like uh, JPEG mini that actually take out all of the information in a JPEG that's not really needed and actually make the size smaller. So over time, your storage, you need less storage. And now a new tool came out that I'm excited about. I'm still like researching it, but it's called Rossi, where it does the same for raw files. And that means because one of our problems as photographers, we have so we need so many hard drives for all our past like raw mm-hmm. images for clients and stuff and backing those up. So I think maybe even having a system in place where maybe after a year or two, all the raw files that weren't delivered or were just like deleted photos that didn't really matter at the at the end process for your clients to receive, maybe even removing those so that you don't need to take up that extra terabyte space on your hard drives and then you'd less hard drives. So Absolutely, even just thinking yeah. of it as like, needing less hard drives overall and making sure you're always culling everything down in on that, yeah. right? If you can think about digital house cleaning as much mm-hmm. as possible, you're going to be really helping to curb your footprint as a photography business because just think about every single time you do a Google search, even just a Google search, that goes to a server somewhere or that runs through a server somewhere. So minimizing the amount of space that we require digitally for our business is a huge footprint reduction. And it's a really important one. It's actually like up there on the list of things that are, you know, one of the largest contributors to climate change is our digital footprint. And it's one that we just don't think about because we can't see it. Wow. You just blew my mind. I never even thought of that at all. Like most people don't, I had no no idea that even existed as a concept until I started to look into, you know, um, one of the best resources out there for sort of all the solutions that we have in the world so far for curbing climate change is a book called Project Drawdown. And I really encourage everyone to go grab it. It's such an interesting resource. And it just basically goes through all the different ways that we have already existing to sort of help the climate crisis and digital footprints is a huge aspect of that. So if you're interested in learning more, check out Project Drawdown. Wow. Okay. Great tip. And we'll link that in the show notes too for you guys. So you can easily find it. Um, Also, 
something that came to mind. So one uh, product I think we do end up giving our couples is like, it's usually a surprise for, for me, at least for my clients and some photographers say it's included, but like a little keepsake box with like their names engraved and just some prints and maybe like a USB or something. So I deliver wooden ones, custom made wooden ones. And I think other, most photographers do wooden. I see other ones maybe delivering glass. Is there Would you say, is there a difference between like what's better or not, or maybe should we be thinking of a different material? Um, I mean, when you're looking at like such a small, small uh, thing on the consumption scale, like one of the things that's super detrimental about the way we talk about the climate crisis is that all the onus gets put on the individual. And ultimately, like those beautiful keepsakes that people are going to keep for the rest of their lives are not contributing to the climate crisis. Like that is just absolutely not, you know, something that is going to be contributing in a a major way in the way that like your digital footprint truly actually might. Mm -hmm. Um, But yeah, I mean, in that capacity, we always have to remember that sustainability has so many different pillars in it that are involved. And so when we're talking about sustainability, one of the most overlooked things is the people that are involved in sustainability. How can we create local economies? How can we support local? How can we bring our our dollar closer to home? So for that, I would say, how can we more include local vendors into that equation? How can we get those things made locally, handmade with, you know, organic materials, like you're saying, like wood and glass? So yeah, I think that would be a better way to sort of think about that because that sort of consumption level really isn't affecting the climate too much. Yeah. Okay. So even for example, um, if we order our album, instead of ordering it for in Canada, instead of ordering it from the US, from Canada, because then the shipping will be less. Totally. And yeah. Okay, cool. Awesome. Um, so I heard this quote, and I believe it's by Anne Marie Bonu. I don't know how to oh, say yeah, she's the best. Um, that stuck with me. Like it stuck, I heard it and it was like years ago and it just stuck with me. And I had to look it up to make sure it's like uh, phrased properly, but we don't need a handful of people doing zero waste perfectly. We need millions of people doing it imperfectly. Mm-hmm. So for those photographers that care about the environment so much, like so, so much, how can they let go on being so hard on themselves when they don't have it down perfectly in their business or in their personal life. Yeah. I think the best way to go about that is do your research, like do your independent research on how much um, companies and governments want us to feel as the individual that it is our fault the climate crisis exists and it's our job to curb it. Um, A great book to read uh, is This Changes Everything by Naomi Klein. Um, It's an incredible rumination on how capitalism is the main driving force of climate change. And we know that to be true. Climate change is because of a system of capitalism and consumerism and extraction of both planet and people. So when we talk about individual footprints, it can be a really great way, a really really great um, like gateway drug to get people involved in environmentalism and looking forward with their advocacy, but it's a dangerous um, notion to assume that it's all on the individual when we exist in a linear economy that's set up in capitalism. So I think what you can do as an individual and an individual business owner is really start to look at the ways that you can make a bigger difference in both policy, um, government, local government, get involved in your community. How can you bring your community dollar closer to home? Like start to look at those more structural things. Um, yeah, I think don't get hung up hung up too much on on all these little minute things. Your individual footprint is of course important mm-hmm. and like we want to have our finger on it for sure. But I think use that as like your jumping off point to do your broader research on, you know, what the systemic changes are that need to happen. Yeah. And if we can get involved more as business owners, as entrepreneurs, if we can get involved more in influencing local politics and policies being written, what goes into law, those sort of things are how we can move the tide a lot better. Man, you just gave me like an aha moment because I'm so, I read so much about like business, business books, productivity. And there's this book called The One Thing where it tells you what is the one thing you can do, you can focus on and work on that will make everything else easier and create the most impact. And it's just like, ding, ding. Like, yes. Like, for example, this is what always drives me nuts. This is an example of me uh, going out to, uh, to Subway, right? They usually don't ask if I need a bag. They just 
put it in there and it's a plastic bag. And usually before COVID and all of that, like I would just sit down and eat right in there. And a lot of people did that. And all I would, at one point it hit me that I was getting a bagged item. I was sitting down, I was eating my sub and then I was throwing it out. So it went from counter to counter and garbage. Like, and yeah. I was noticing people around me with the same thing. Like they just had a bag empty on the table beside them when they were just sitting down right there. And I was like, this is stupid. So ever since that moment, which was probably five or six years ago, every time I say, Hey, I don't need a bag. I don't need a bag. And like, if I ever like can carry out items out of a store, if I forget my reusable bag or whatever, I say, I don't need a bag. It's okay. I can put it in my purse, whatever. So I've been really, really good there, but I'm, re- yeah, I'm realizing like, that's me doing that really well. But what if I reached out to Subway and like had a whole mm-hmm. bunch of people reach out to Subway and say, how are you still offering plastic bags and not even training your um, your employees to really double check. Are you dining in? Or are you dining out? You know, because they weren't even, that wasn't even in their workflow or anything. So yeah, right. you just helped me realize like you just have, we just have to take that one step further where maybe it'll take us a little bit more time initially of like maybe three hours to 40 hours of like us trying to reach out to this place and getting more people to do that. But then later on, the effects will be much more powerful. Attention fellow wedding photographers and fellow wannabe wedding photographers. Tell me if this sounds like you. You're scared of missing key moments on wedding days. You feel pressured to create photos that are quote unquote Pinterest perfect and Instagram worthy. You're nervous about all the different lighting scenarios that are out of your control and you're not sure how to handle them. You're confused on how to balance creating beautiful imagery while also capturing authentic moments and emotion. And you're worried about being in people's way way too often. If you're like, hells yeah, Sarah, you read my mind, then I'm here all excited and bushy tailed. Yes, I had to throw in the squirrel reference to let you know that I've created something for you that will help you become a confident wedding day storyteller in just two weeks. It's an online program that I created just for you called Intuitive Storytelling, and it's officially out and ready for enrollment. I want you to take a moment and imagine for a second what life would be like if you knew how to be at the right place at the right time on wedding days so you can catch those key and in-between moments. You got emails back from your clients saying, you were the best freaking decision we made for our wedding. You also knew how to confidently create strong storytelling photos that people felt emotionally connected to, and you finally felt like an actual fly on the wall, aka people don't stare into your camera all day anymore. Well, it's all possible because I consistently experience these things myself, and now I want to help you make these possibilities become your reality. Are you all bright-eyed and bushy-tailed right now too? Again, had to throw in the scroll reference, you know me. So listen up. You can get started on learning all my tips and tricks of how I document wedding days as soon as today. You can go to saramonica.com forward slash storytelling for all the deets and instructions on how to grab your copy of the course. You'll have lifetime access and you can go at it at your own pace along with a private community of other like-minded photographers that are on the same journey as you are. With intuitive storytelling, you'll be able to learn how to confidently storytell like a pro on wedding days in just two weeks. So what are you waiting for? Uplevel your storytelling game this wedding season so that next year you'll be watching your inbox filling up with even more inquiries. Hello referrals from this year's clients. So again, head over to saramonica.com forward slash storytelling and sign up now. I cannot wait to see you in there. Yeah. And and above and beyond that, how can we canvas our politicians to actually legitimately put policy in place that that prohibits Subway from even using that plastic bag. Right. So, you know, like how can we get so involved in our local politics and and so involved um, in creating structural change that, you know, like Toronto just announced their amazing, you know, ban on single-use plastics, which is incredible. And that's due to the incredible activism of so many, um, you know, environmental activists like hounding down the door um, for this kind of change. Um, and then it's important to remember too that, 
like the system that we live in, in terms of like how we move through our life in a capitalistic structure, structure that too is problematic. So we need to all be focusing our attention on really like educating ourselves on whether or not our system that we live in right now even functions at all for the health of our planet. So I would say like the biggest impact that you can make now is getting involved in your community, getting involved in your local politics, having a hand in trying to sway those policies. And then on top of that, do start to do your, your research, start to do your learning on the kind of system that we live in and, and whether it's beneficial for planet or people at all. Right. So would you have any any tips on like how someone could even, because for me right now, you saying this, I'm just like, I have no idea where to even start to like get involved in my community. And yeah. Yeah. Like, do you have any tips on how we could do that better? My favorite way that I say, if you are not inclined to local politics at all, you have no idea who like, who even is your MPP or, you know, like who even are these people that I'm supposed to be engaging with? Just do a quick Google search, like right off the top, like who is my MPP in the city? Who is my MP? Like find out who those people are. Start following them on social media. Start following them on Twitter. Start following them on Instagram. Start becoming um, intimate with who they are as people. And you, you'll you be surprised about how many things maybe they might already be working on that you're passionate about. For instance, my MPP is Jill Andrew because I'm up here in St. Paul in Toronto. And I had no idea who she was before the Black Lives Matter movement. I wasn't involved in my local politics in a way, especially because I i wasn't home. I was living in the States for a long time. Mm-hmm. Um, so I didn't even know who my local MPP was. I became passionate about reaching out to her through the Black Lives Matter movement. And then I found out that she's already so incredibly invested and involved Mm -hmm. in all of these community ventures that I was passionate about. So it became this great thing where I was able to become really involved in her politics because she was already really invested in them. But I would never have known that I had that ally in my local government if I hadn't taken the time to get to know her as a person. So I really encourage like on a local level, um, stop trying to think about our politics in Canada as just Justin Trudeau. Yeah. And, you know, it's it's not that it's it's a system of localized governments that we have to become really um, intimate with. Right. Oh my gosh. You just broke it down for me so well. And I'm, so I'm someone like I, my fiance, Rory, he just is so, he understands how all of the stuff works and he teaches me so much. He keeps me in the loop before him. I was just totally ignorant. I didn't vote. Like I was totally just in my bubble. I think it was just the way I was raised. Cause I don't think my parents trusted politicians. They're like, how do you yeah, sure. to trust all of that? Right. And I think a lot of young people, think that way in the beginning. Mm -hmm. And I'm starting to realize how important it is to understand what's going on. And you just giving me this nugget of like, yeah, just like follow them on social media, see what they're doing, reach out to them whenever things are happening and you want to affect that change. You just like really help me see how I can actually make a change instead of feeling overwhelmed. Like, but how do I like reach the government? Like how do this me, this tiny person, right? So yeah, thank yeah you I mean, your local, so <laughs> your local representatives are available. They're available to you and they're oh. available in a lot of different ways. Like I've gotten responses like just from casual questions on Instagram from Joe Andrew, my MPP, and like they can help you in all sorts of ways to advance, you know, social structures that you think are important. And as small business owners, as entrepreneurs, it's even more crucial to be in contact and to know your local governments because they're the ones who are hands-on affecting your businesses. Yeah. So for instance, like in Toronto here, we've just gone back down into lockdown. And I know as photographers, there's all these restrictions upon who you can and cannot shoot now, right? Like Mm -hmm. you can shoot businesses and brands, but not individuals. And how is that any different, right? You know, and so your MPP is who you would go to, to talk to those things and ask for help and ask for clarification. And Um, in terms of waste, like if you as a business owner, as an entrepreneur has an issue with the system set up in your city as a business owner, that's who you'd go to to start that conversation. So I think that connection between business owners, especially artists like photographers and your MPPs and your MPs are so crucial. So I would encourage that if you want to become more systemically involved, really just reach out to your politicians and get to know them. Amazing. Like, thank you so much for sharing that. I'm so, yep, I'm so inspired right now. Thank you. <laughs> I'm so glad. 
Um, and I'm sure a ton of the listeners, listeners right now are, are like thinking, holy shit, I didn't even know that. So yeah, we just like, you just create a ripple effect. I can feel it. That's amazing. Um, okay. So I did want to ask, um, another thing. So in my wedding collection menu, like where my couples can pick whatever experience they want with me, um, I have it listed that every wedding booked with me, a person gets clean water for the first time in their lives forever. And I do this basically via uh, charity water. And then depending on how many clients I have throughout the year, I make a lump sum donation at the end of the year. So for those that may want to include something that's more around sustainability, sustainability or environment in their wedding packages, is there anything you would suggest that they can kind of include in there? Um, I know you mentioned uh, carbon offsetting. Is that kind of like the only thing that would come to mind or do you have any other ideas for that? Yeah, tons. Um, yeah, look into like it, carbon offsetting is so easy to find a ton about. Like if you just, it's such a hot topic right now, and you can dive down into the ins and outs of carbon offsetting and whether people believe it's actually useful or or what have you. But there's so many organizations doing really cool carbon offsetting out there. So take a look at that. But then I would encourage people again to think about sustainability in a bit more of a wider scope. So the S word sustainability is become this word that is so overused by brands trying to sell us stuff. You know, like you go, you can go onto McDonald's website and look at their sustainability tab, which is absolutely laughable. Um, but so, so sustainability has become this like some synonymous term with like eco or green. Right. And ultimately if we think about what the word sustainable actually means, it means is a system able to be sustained And in order for something to be sustainable, we have to think of a bunch of different pillars within it. And one of them is social justice. We cannot decouple this idea that climate justice and racial justice are unlinked. If we think that way, we're never going to, you know, figure out the climate crisis. We have to figure out and understand that this system of extraction and exploitation is one that harms both people and planet. And those systems are the same one and they're linked. So if you're also looking for a way to be more sustainable with your approach, look to social justice organizations, look to organizations that are helping people who have been marginalized, look towards um, donating to social justice institutions. It's the closest and quickest way that we can really tap into the heart of sustainability, which is the people that the climate crisis is affecting. So I'd go that route too, if you're looking for more, more ways to donate. And so I'm trying to like, I've never thought of it that way. And of course you just said, most people don't think that they're linked, but they are. Is there like a way that you can maybe um, explain it a little bit more, like give an example maybe of like how they can, they are linked? Yeah, absolutely. Um, It's, probably one of the most misunderstood terms is climate justice. And it's a really trendy word for people to chuck up on Instagram right now. And I don't say that to be judgmental because we are all learning so much at such a fast rate right now. But if we really look at the real meaning of climate justice, it's the intersection between racial justice and the climate crisis and how the climate crisis affects people and who's being affected quickest, most commonly, and hardest. Mm -hmm. And so a great example would be um, we've got this system of single-use plastics that are not meant to be reused or long-lasting, which end up in landfill, which end up seeping into the water, which end up making undrinkable water. If we look at the map of these toxic waste dumps that come from yeah, single-use products, um, waste management facilities, um, pulp and paper mills, all of these sort of toxic um, systems, they overwhelmingly are placed in community of, communities of color. So, and that's not by mistake, that's on purpose. Um, can you think of one wealthy white neighborhood that has a toxic dump next to it. No. Uh, so if yeah. you look at the map of Canada and you look at the place that all these toxic places are being placed, they're almost always next to communities of color that have little to no agency to advocate against these systems. Um, again, like another example, like the, the global example is just how quickly um, countries, predominantly marginalized con- countries, are feeling the effects of climate change before predominantly wealthy countries are feeling the effects of climate change. So, you know, there's a handful of uh, countries that are responsible for the mass of emissions. Uh, 
you know, contributing to the climate crisis and they're not the countries generally at risk right now. So that's another way we see that, you know, people and planet are linked in that way and that climate justice is is a human rights issue. And there's so many more. I mean, look at the, all the pipelines going through indigenous lands and there's just endless examples of how the climate crisis is affecting people of color and marginalized people more often and harder. Right. So, okay. So you're saying that if we also donate and help social justice issues, we can help lift them up to create more equality, equity all around. And then everybody can tackle the issue faster in a better way. Is that what you're saying basically? Yeah. Yeah, Yeah. absolutely. Yeah. For sure. Wow. That's powerful. Oh my gosh. Okay. You just, I've never, I didn't even expect to look at this whole issue in a whole different light. And I'm really grateful for you. Um, yeah, sharing it with me. I'm just like, I'm kind of speechless right now (laughs) that I didn't see all the links that you had mentioned. And I think you're going to really open up people's eyes and you've opened up mine. Um, and yeah, I'm going to definitely take this, what I've learned and really, feel empowered to be able to feel like I can make a difference, more of a difference than I thought I could. So yeah, absolutely. Never, ever, ever um, underestimate the power that we have as individuals to make change. It's not necessarily going to come from, you know, using your beeswax wraps, like that's great and so necessary. And we need to curb (laughs) our our individual footprints for sure. But more often than not, what we need to harness is our power as change makers, as individuals and our power of empathy. I think that's like the biggest thing missing out of a lot of climate work is this notion and this idea that we're not harming the planet. The planet will outlast us. We're harming each other and we're harming each other at disproportionate rates. And we need to really look at the privilege that's embedded in environmentalism and how and who it's affecting first and hardest and how we can help them. Wow. Okay. I think that's like an amazing place to just leave this off. Very powerful thought. And yeah, thank you so much for your time and your perspective and sharing everything that you've learned along the way on your journey. Yes. Thank you so much for having me. Before we go, I totally forgot to ask Julia where you guys all can find her. So let her, let everybody know. Yeah. So if you're interested in sort of my individual footprint, uh, low waste world, you can find me at zero waste warbler, like the bird, uh, on Instagram. If you're interested in my not-for-profit, which is bridging the gap between sustainability and the theater industry, you can find me at Canadian Green Alliance. Amazing. And what about the three other businesses? <laughs> <laughs> if you're interested in my acting shenanigans, you can find me at Julia Emily McClellan. And if you're interested in learning how to sing, you can find me at Coach with Julia. <laughs> what was the last one? Say it again. Coach with Julia. Okay, amazing. I love that. Yeah, we'll link all of those all in the show notes for you guys. So you don't have to be like, if you're driving, wait, I need to write those down. They're <laughs> all in the show notes. <laughs> okay, so now we can say farewell till next time. <laughs> Bye, guys. Yay! Thank you so much for hanging out with me and tuning into this episode. If you got value out of it, please feel free to message me on Instagram at Sarah Monica Photo. That's Sarah No H Monica with a K Photo to let me know. I get so freaking energized hearing from others that what I've said has had a positive impact on their lives. Also, make sure to hit subscribe to the Shine and Thrive podcast to never miss an episode. I'm so grateful for you and I'm sending you all the productive vibes your way so you have the best week ever. 